Your love is a fountain that never runs dry. Every morning, your mercy is new. You're calling me closer. I fall into you. Attention, and I give all my affection. What can I say? You've taken my breath away. Your glory is shining like stars in the night. I'm breathing your presence with arms open wide. in you I'm finally found Never been so free When you surround When you surround And you have all my attention And I give all my affections What can I say You've taken I'm so in awe of all of your goodness I'm overcome, alive in your presence What can I say? You're taking my breath away Every time, and every time that my heart beats, let it beat for you. And every time that my soul sings, let it sing for you. And every time that my heart beats, let it beat for you. And every time that my soul sings, let it sing for you, for you, for you. And you have all my attention, and I give all my affection. What can I say? You've taken my breath away. Trinity. Um, we've got, we're kind of changing things up a little bit this morning. So this is your one song for now. <laughs> if y'all want to sit down, we'll uh, continue in worship in a different way this morning. Hey, um, as you guys know, a few weeks ago, um, we, we began a new series called Next Steps, and I made this analogy of a wheel and I made fun of the Sooner Schooner. I didn't know the wheel was going to come off. I, I, I feel horrible. Um, and then, who knew yesterday the wheels were really going to come off? Um, I knew I had to say, have some smart aleck remark. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I'm going to ask Josie and Tracy to join me up here. Um, you guys in this service get to uh, to be led in worship by Josie every Sunday. Uh, this guy you may not know, his name is Tracy Shear, and uh, Tracy leads our early worship time here at Trinity. And um, 
so I'm so blessed by both of these people because I, I don't know of two more gifted worship leaders than the two that I get to share uh, the platform with right now. They have such an incredible gift from the Lord. And um, I've, I've known Josie since she was a little girl growing up here at Trinity. And then uh, Tracy and I, uh, we've known, I, I told the group earlier, we've known, I remember when we both had hair. Uh, so we've known each other for a long, long time. But um, I just want to, really for us to take this time for you to get to hear from their heart a little bit and uh, about what this thing of worship really looks at because the spoke of the wheel today is worship and, and exactly what that looks like. So uh, I, I just want to ask them a couple of questions. And so um, uh, Josie and I were, uh, were talking this week that, um, that when we think of worship in the context of the church that we usually think about praying and singing. And and, and I get it, I know that worship uh, occurs when both of those things happen, but it's a lot deeper. And uh, so, Josie, if you would just take a few minutes just to share with us from your heart about what really that, that looks like for, for us and for you uh, to think about it is more than just praying and singing. I'm going to share your table here. You sure can. <laughs> Y'all bear with me. I'm naturally awkward, as is, so hi. Um, <laughs> I get nervous when I'm standing up here, so hopefully the Lord will just grace us and his words will flow through and not my messy self. Um, but as Rusty just said, we sat down earlier this week and talked through um, what this time looked like today. And um, I know for probably the majority of you, including myself, when I when worship is mentioned in a conversation, my mind immediately goes to music because that's what I do, you know, here every week. And um, though music is a great vehicle for worship, it runs so much deeper. Um, but anyway, so I'll unpack a little bit here and hopefully not <laughs> words. Sometimes they're hard. <laughs> um, but what is clearly laid out for us in scripture and what I believe, in my opinion, um, Worship begins with the posture of our heart towards God. Um, so in Matthew uh, chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, um, Jesus addresses the people and where Isaiah prophesied and said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Um, and again, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17, it says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So we see very clearly that um, it's easy to do a service with your lips, but for your heart to be fully engaged, it's a little more difficult at times. Um, but to worship God is to ascribe worth to him. Um, in this book I read uh, not too long ago called How to Worship a King, the author says, if the cross proves how much we are worth to God, our worship proves how much God is worth to us. So in our the greatest commandment we've been given is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we do those things, we are worshiping him. And there's a lot of things that we can love with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Right. There's a lot of things that we can put on that pedestal. I gave this analogy in the 830 service. I'm a foodie. I love some food, and it's easy for food to be up on a pedestal. I'm looking forward to some good food after the service today. You know, there's a lot of things that we can fill in the blank of placing in that pedestal of worshiping with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, but when we place the Lord there, we worship him fully. And we can't accomplish that on our own. Um, we are able to worship him with all of those components because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross. If he hadn't come and done that atoning work for us, died been crucified on the cross and raised again to life, there would be no reason for worship. He's established that new covenant, so we have access to God, um, to worship. Um, so I just, I want to leave us with this question. It's one that has really helped me ponder 
just how deep worship runs and how that should um, take place in our life. To really understand the glorious depth of worship, um, we must ask ourselves these questions. How much do we value God? Do we love him? Do we honor him? Do we come here in this place in reverent fear of who he is? And um, you can keep going on and uh, just reflecting on that question. But most importantly, how big of a throne are we building for the Lord in our heart? So I worship starts with the posture of our heart. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Tracy and, and I, I told the group earlier, Tracy and I have, have been doing this since before Josie was having birthdays. And um, one of the things that's always, um, I just think always a challenge is that sometimes, you, you may or may not get this, and I don't mean to be mean, but sometimes we stand up here and it's like looking at a Norman Rockwell painting. It's just like everybody's just kind of frozen in time. And um, so, Tracy, just kind of talk through it with, with us because I think one of the greatest challenges you guys have as lead worshipers is getting us as people to be engaged in worship. Now that's true, and it's always been true, whether it's contemporary uh, music or traditional music. Uh, I think what Josie's trying to say and what we all have to realize and will help us be engaged is worship is when we realize who God is, and, man, that's huge. Mm. All he is and all he's done for us. And then at the same time, we realize who we are how sinful and in need of a Savior we are. Yeah. And then we come together to celebrate that and to thank Him and to praise Him. And we also have to realize no matter what the music is, music is not a spectator sport. Right. And we turn it into that many times. Whether it's the contemporary service or the traditional service, I hear people saying, I really enjoyed that today like they'd been to a concert. Or I didn't really care for that so much. Hmm. They're critiquing what's going on. Like worship is taking place here and they're observing it. You know, in a worship service, the leaders are leading worship and worshiping. You as the congregation are being led and worshiping. But Amen. the audience is the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We worship together for an audience of one. So when we can remember that, then our participation becomes vital and it becomes something we'll automatically do. Amen, amen. The, um, you know, one of the things that we, we were in a worship meeting a couple of weeks ago that I know that both of you all were a part of, but um, the, the drummer of the day, Trevor, made a statement, is that most people, when they come to church, when they come to worship, are really not prepared to worship. What do you, uh, just kind of unpack that for us and what is that, uh, you know, how, how, can, how can we be prepared so when we walk in here we're ready to worship? You know, like any preparation, I think preparation for worship has to be intentional. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was in a worship service in April of 1993 in St. Petersburg, Russia. I was with the singing churchman on a mission trip and we were, we were there an hour or so before the service and we were going through things and getting prepared to, to sing for the worship service. And I looked up in the balcony and there was an elderly woman who had obviously walked probably miles and miles to get there. And even though it was an hour before the service was to start, she stood and she was praying and you could tell she was pouring her heart out to God. I asked some of the leaders in the church what, their, what her situation was. And they said, she does this every, every Sunday. Mm. Every Sunday she comes and pours her heart out to God to prepare to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult for us sometimes, isn't it? And I'll, I'll be the first to say, I come to worship sometimes not prepared at all spiritually. I haven't really thought about it since a few days before when I when I wrote out the order and thought about it then and prayed about it then. But we need to be intentional. We need to start hours or days before preparing 
for the time that we will worship the Lord with each other on the Lord's day, Amen. being intentional. Amen. What do you, um, Josie, what do you do to, uh, you know, we talked, Tracy's talked about us being prepared for worship. What do you do, um, you know, as a, as a lead worshiper up here to, to really be prepared yourself to, to lead us in worship? Well, to follow up on what Tracy just said, um, there are times when, you know, I am prepared, but sadly, our human nature, we're imperfect, and praise the Lord, and God's grace has covered us. Um, sometimes I step foot up here, and I'm anxious, and the enemy is attacking my mind, and sometimes it's hard. I'm just shaking with anxiety throughout a whole service, you know, and um, praise the Lord. Sometimes that that happens, and sometimes it's just nice and smooth sailing. Um, but uh, one thing that I do individually um, to prepare my heart and uh, just something that has helped me, and maybe this will encourage you as well, uh, we just we live in a very fast paced culture, and um, especially for me on a Sunday morning, it's easy when that alarm goes off, my feet hit the floor and I'm going, you know. And but taking that, finding a time to carve out um, just to be in solitude with the Lord, He longs for us to have that one on one time with Him. Um, so before I get going, I try to. Get alone in a quiet space, and um, I just try to humble myself, and sometimes that takes a posture physically. Um, It helps me to tune out the rest of the world um, just by getting down on my hands and knees and face to the floor and just really focus on being there alone with the Lord, and um, never fails that time. He always quiets my heart quiets my soul, and I just, I thank him first and foremost for who he is, Um, and I pray for these amazing people I get to serve with. Um, We're we're in the middle of a battlefield, and so we've got to remember to pray for each other um, as we serve and do the Lord's work, and I pray over our church and just try to use that time to prepare my heart to lead well. I was going to read this earlier and forgot. Um, uh, Clay shared this um, with the youth Wednesday night, and so I'm going to share part of this quote. It was just so powerful and a great reminder of, I think I said this earlier, but we get to worship because Jesus made that possible. Mm -hmm. He gave us that access. And so this is a part of the quote that he shared Wednesday. Um, it says, the purpose of God in redemption is to restore us again to the divine imperative of worship. We were created to worship, but sin destroyed that ability. Jesus Christ on the cross redeemed us and brought us back to the place where we can now worship and have fellowship with God Almighty. Amen. I think when we remind ourselves of that, that prepares my heart to do what he's called me to do here. So. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we, we appreciate uh, these two and so many who are involved in our worship ministry. And, man, what a great, uh, what a great blessing they are to us. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, hey, I want you to take your Bible this morning, and I'm going to ask you to turn to a couple of different passages of Scripture. Um, one is in your Old Testament in the book of Malachi. If you've not been there, it's uh, one chapter left of the Gospel of Matthew. And then uh, also, as we've been over the last several weeks, we um, will be in the book of Hebrews. Today, we're going to be in the 10th chapter of uh, of the book of of Hebrews. One of the things we've talked about over the last several weeks as we've launched into this series of next steps, we talked about this thing of, in Hebrews chapter 2, of us drifting away. And unfortunately, many of our steps that we take take us away from the Lord. Um, And I think that occurs even in our times of worship. Um, And when we begin to drift away from the Lord in worship, to take steps away from Him in worship, our worship becomes something that's more just just almost routine. 
Um, it becomes very methodical. Uh, it becomes very systematic for us. If somebody throws us a curveball, it just messes us up. Uh, it just weirds us out. And, um, and so it can become that for us where it's almost like we're just simply going through the motions. And it's, it's weird to me how that can happen even in our worship of the Lord. That the thing that ought to draw us closer to God, sometimes it creates distance in our relationship with God. I think it's, um, I think it's tragic when that occurs in our lives. Because God created us to be worshipers. And as Josie said a few moments ago, every, every one of us in this room is a worshiper. That's who, that's who God made you to be. That, that, we are, that we are wired for worship. That's how God made us. But our worship to God becomes so disconnected because we simply look at it as just that routine in our life. And we walk in here Sunday after Sunday and we crank out service after service, and, and what Josie and Tracy shared, it, it's a challenge that's real for us. Because it, if, if not careful, we can fall into that pattern of it just becoming routine, again, just cranking out Sunday after Sunday, service after service, sermon after, after sermon. And in fact, we reach a place, if we're not careful, that we have allowed so much drift to occur in our life in the place of worship and so much distance to occur in, the, in, 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 in our worship, that we walk in here and we don't even sense the presence of the Lord. In fact, if, if God showed up, it would, it would weird some of us out. Because He might give us a sense of direction of, of, uh, that, that's not tradition. It's not following the patterns that, we are, that we're used to. And so when we think about this thing of worship, I think it's, I think it's important for us to, to trace what that's looked like in, in Scripture. And so if we climbed onto the time chariot and traveled back in time to 1446 B.C., when this worship was uh, basically as the Passover and what Christ would later do for us in the fulfillment of that in the book of Hebrews, we read about it that, um, man, it, it, was, it was just crazy. Especially when you get to the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers. And I'm talking to a room full of people that there have been, time, there's, there have been years in your life where you thought, you know what, this is a year I'm going to read the Bible through. And you were doing great till you got to Leviticus. Am I right? It's like all this weird stuff about putting ash on your foot. And, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. And then you come to numbers and so-and-so begat so-and-so and you get caught up in all that because you can't pronounce the names. Don't, don't try and be spiritual. Just do, I don't know how to pronounce them either. If I do it with confidence, you think I know what I'm talking about. I don't have a clue. So for me, when I read it, it's just hard name, hard name. I, I don't know how to say their name, but we, we get bogged down. And it, it, it happened. It happened to the people even when we rewind all the way back in the Old Testament. Climb back in the chariot and make it to 1000 B.C. Or, or excuse me, a thousand years later, about 445 B.C., when the book of Malachi was written. Um, we discovered it, was, it, was, it had become a huge challenge. Worship had become a huge challenge in people's lives. In fact, if you read the conversation that takes place in Malachi chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 6 in just a moment, but when you begin to read this conversation, it's important to understand that the people are having a conversation with God. Typically, the conversations we have about worship are horizontal. What do you think about that song? What do you think about that service? What do you think about the volume today. What, do you, what did you think about Rusty's sermon today? And so we, we have horizontal conversations when it comes to worship. But, but I want you to understand this. The conversation that you need to have about worship is a vertical conversation that you have with God. God, what have I allowed my worship to become? 
Has it become shallow? Has it become indifferent? Has it become methodical? Has it become powerless? Do, do I sense your presence and your power on my life when I come to worship you? And so Malachi 1.6, they're, they're having a conversation with God. It says a son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? You see, they're, they're having a conversation with God. God says, you, you, you've despised my name. God, how, how, do, how do we do that? He tells them in verse 7, By presenting defiled food on my altar, how have we defiled you, you ask, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible? When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor, Ask the Lord of armies? And now plead for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favor, Ask the Lord of armies? It's interesting that God asks them a series of questions that all relate to their worship. I think God has some questions for us. Well, why have you allowed your, your, your worship to, be so, to become so shallow? Why are you not giving awe and respect to my name? Why, why, why do you come not prepared to be in the presence of the Lord? How, how is it that you, could, that you could become so content of just going through the motions of this and there's really no power? The presence of God doesn't have the freedom to work and move in our lives. So God asks him a series of questions, and then, then he makes a series of statements. He impacts it for us in verse 10, because he says in the last part of verse 9, the Lord, this conversation, this asking has gone on, and then he makes a declarative statement. I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar, exclamation point. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies. And I will accept no offering from your hands. That's heavy stuff. God said, I'm so displeased, I'm so despised by your worship. I wish you'd just shut the door. You bring these sacrifices that are not worthy sacrifices and blind and lame animals. You bring those, your governor wouldn't even accept that, but you expect me to, to accept that. I guess I don't accept that. I'm tired of this. Frustrated with all of this. Where am I in the midst of all of that? They were dealing with these huge worship wars, which really goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, but it really comes to a head in Malachi chapter 1. You know, we, we talk about worship wars, wars and we think about all the way back to the 80s and 90s when when we started singing uh, choruses in church, I've heard them called everything under the sun. You know, we, we sing ditties and 7-Eleven songs or whatever we want to call it. And so we, we, we call that worship wars. Listen, those are horizontal conversations. That's not vertical conversation. Is God pleased with our worship? It doesn't matter if it's traditional or contemporary, what that looks like. Is God pleased with the worship of our life? Is he honored by that? Is he exalted by that? A huge, huge battle that comes to a conclusion in Malachi chapter 1. In fact, they get to this place in verse 12. You are profaning it when you say the Lord's table is defiled and its, and its product, its food, is contemptible. And you say, look, and what a nuisance. I think the worship can become that in our lives. It's a nuisance. We just, it's almost like, man, I, 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 just, I just don't feel like it today. I, just, I think I'll stay home today. I think I'll go to church in my underwear today and just watch and listen. It's just a nuisance. It breaks the heart of God when we reach that, that place in our lives. If we, 
jump back in and travel to A.D. 65, you will discover that the recipients of the letter of, to the Hebrews was struggling with this same thing. And he says to them in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not neglecting together together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day approaching. I love what the Amplified says, not neglecting to meet together for instruction and worship. That you're not neglecting that. Do you understand how critical it is and you understand how important it is for you to come together in worship. If we jump in one more time and we come to October the 27th, 2019, the question I have for all of us is, what does our worship become? What does your worship become? You see, we have this incredible invitation given to us by the Lord to enter into His presence. He tells us in Hebrews 10, 19 that we enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Through the shed blood of Christ, we enter into the sanctuary. He has inaugurated for us, verse 20, a new and living way through a curtain, that is, through His flesh, Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance. You need to understand that worship biblically is a verb. It's action. It's movement. And he tells us what that action and that movement looks like because he says what needs to happen in your life is that you need to draw near to God. That's action and movement to realize that there is this distance In your relationship between you and the Lord, you have allowed that to happen. You may have even caused that to happen. But there is this separation, this distance that has occurred in your life. He gives us this invitation to come boldly to His throne. Yet we reject it. We choose to say no to Him, to reject His his forgiveness, to stay in our sin. Hebrews 10, 2-4 in the New Living Translation said, If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. If you've never come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and you're struggling under the guilt and the presence and the power of sin in your life, I have great news for you. This statement from Hebrews 10.10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Your sins can be forgiven, but yet even as believers... We struggle with this, these feelings of guilt over our, over our sin. But He changed all of that when He came as the new and the better way, as this new covenant inaugurated for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we reject His invitation. Sometimes we refuse to be drawn into His presence, to enter in, to draw near. And we just go Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And we crank it out, service after service, sermon after sermon. And you set through it week after week after week. But I think like the people that the letter was written to in the book of Hebrews, sometimes we neglect Him. Not neglecting meeting together for instruction and worship. I had a conversation with my friend James Swain who works for Oklahoma Baptist and he said that LifeWay has cranked out some new research. And now the, that LifeWay, which is the, the over, overarching part of, 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 of our denomination, considers someone an active church member if they attend on average 1.6 times per month. If, you, if you're here 1.6 times a month on average, you're considered an active church member. I would say to you that I think we have a God who deserves better. We, we have a God who deserves better than that. We, we have a God who is worthy of our worship, who is 
drawing us to himself. We need to be drawn into his presence. We need to come together corporately to worship the Lord. I'm no Bible scholar. But I think the only place that, that, that I can find in Scripture where God seeks something from us where God seeks something from us is found in the book of John and the fourth chapter in the 23rd verse. It's the only place I know of where God seeks something from us. Here's the scripture. But an hour is coming and it's now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeks such people to be His worshipers. The Father seeks such people to be His worshipers. God is seeking your worship. He seeks you to worship Him. That's what He desires for all of us is that we would become worshipers of Him, not just to pray and to sing, but that we would enter into His presence, that we would come to His table and 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 partake in the greatest expression of worship of the body given and the blood shed for our sins. He commands us, verse 22 of Hebrews 10, to draw near. To partake, verse 19, that we enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, verse 20, that He has inaugurated for us a new living way through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, through His body. That the purest, greatest form of worship is that when we enter into His sanctuary through the blood of Jesus to partake of His blood, to remind us of sacrifice, in His flesh, His body, we enter in through the new and living way, the curtain that is His flesh. I don't need to remind you, I don't think, that God desires and God deserves better from us. That we have a great God who is worthy of our worship. In fact, he repeats over and over again, Malachi chapter 1, verse 5, the the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, he said, My name will be great among the nations. The latter part of verse 11, in every place because my name will be great among the nations. Malachi chapter 1, verse 14, for I am a great king. Listen, we have a great king who is worthy of our worship. How can we come? How can we come and just sit and not draw near? And not draw near through worship. I want to invite you, would if you would please, where you are, just to bow your heads in an attitude and a spirit of prayer. Josie's going to make the way to her to the her way to the platform, but I, I want to I just want to speak into your life for a moment. He says that we we can draw near through the partaking of his blood, Hebrews ten nineteen, and through partaking of his body, Hebrews ten twenty. I think he's saying to us that we need to remember to think about the sacrifice that Christ made for us, that that our Savior has a great name. And so today we're going to worship by partaking of His body and His blood. In a few moments I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to come to the table as you feel led of the Lord. There are three tables here at the front. I'm going to invite you to come as you feel led of the Lord. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I I think we need to do it more often than we do it. And maybe today is, is that day for you that you need to come to draw near, to draw near through his body and through his blood. Josie's going to lead us in singing and directing us through this time of worshiping at the table. 
I invite you to come and to take a piece of bread and to take a cup and you can return to your place. And when you get back to your place, you can take a few moments to just, you and the Lord, just worship. Just take a few minutes to reflect upon the great name of our Savior. Take a few moments, just you and Him, worshiping. And then in the quietness and the solitude of that moment, I'm not going to give you more directions or further directions, but in the quietness and the solitude of that moment, for you to worship God, just you and Him, as you partake of that bread and you partake of that cup. I remind you of the words that Jesus were spoken of Jesus at the Last Supper. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup after giving thanks. He gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Father, we come to this table today to worship you. We thank you for your blood, for your body. It made it possible for us to come into your presence. And Father, I pray that these are moments of intimacy with us. That there's no gap, there's no separation, there's no distance, God, that we're drawn to this table today. God, we're drawn to this table to worship you. As we stand together, as God draws you to this table, will you be drawn today? When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus oh it's all about you King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required 
You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's all about you. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Oh, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus We thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. And I never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I never. But know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross, and I never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I never. The 
Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me this deep heart. No tongue can bid me this deep heart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me Spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is here with Christ on high. Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God, hallelujah. Sweet, sweet 
so may it be a sweet sweet so in